Traumatic brain injury is a spectrum of injury disorder that really begins with those individuals who've had more severe injury, perhaps a hemorrhage in their head, perhaps a shearing related injury. They may require neurosurgical intervention and often have a period of severe disability. At the other end of the spectrum, we have those individuals who have concussion, be that sport-based or blast-related injury from our colleagues in the military, each one of which can produce a transient neurologic dysfunction. The highlight of this issue over the past several years has really been in the mild and concussive area, where we've learned that there are large numbers of young people with sport-related concussion. The number of individuals going to emergency departments, according to the Center for Disease Control, has gone up astronomically. And so we've seen both the media and a real-world highlighting of this issue that has resulted in more clinical visits and also a better appreciation and understanding of what really goes on. When we include the number of people with all traumatic brain injury, we get a number of about 3.5 million a year. But that may be underappreciating the number of people with sport-related concussions. I think if we look at sport-related concussion risk factors, those are often difficult to say, hey, what's a risk factor for TBI versus a risk factor for longer-term problems? But there are a few things we know one of which is gender may be a risk factor. There may be a risk factor within certain genetic groups that is still not completely defined. The kind of sport you play is a risk factor. So football, ice hockey being much greater than things like baseball or volleyball. And then there are risk factors for more uh, challenging sequelae. So those people who've had one concussion have a greater risk of another, certainly within the first um, short period of time. And then those who've had multiple concussions have uh, longer term sequelae if they have another concussion, i.e. Uh, problems uh, that may make their symptoms longer lasting. Another thing is premorbid sleep habits or sleep. If you sleep less than seven hours a night before you ever have a concussion, your odds of having symptoms are much higher. And if you sleep less than five hours, it's even greater than that. And those individuals with learning disability as a baseline really do also have um, a higher incidence of problems in longer term um, sequelae or at least reporting of problems. My colleague put together the clinical factors that we really see and have to evaluate when we're dealing with someone with traumatic brain injury. And they're complex because they have to do with pre-injury factors. Um, what was, did you have a learning disability? Did you have ADHD? Who are you as a baseline person? Uh, do you have a family history of migraines? Do you have migraines? Uh, the event itself, and then post-injury psychosocial pop issues. Is it a family overdoting on you? Is it a need and an urgency and anxiety about performance and returning to work? There are a number of issues. And they all result in cognitive disturbance, emotional disturbance, behavioral disturbance, and physical disturbances that result in a list of symptoms that could be anything from agitation to aggression to sleep disturbance to headaches to visual problems to memory issues. And so that's why this concern is so complex. One of the things we worry about, especially in those under 22, 23 years of age, are the major worry is an issue like second impact syndrome. Now this is a controversial entity that talks about if a young person has had one hit, been still symptomatic, they receive another hit, they can develop some elements of brain swelling and a small subdural hematoma that can lead to some devastating consequences. So unfortunately, there is no magic pill for treatment of mild traumatic brain injury. What we do is go back through the best evidence and we look at trying to wait till people are relatively asymptomatic to where they have returned to their cognitive baseline to limiting some elements of excessive uh, symptom-producing activity, be that physical and or cognitive, 
to trying to treat excessive symptoms, trying to make sure they get some sleep because that improves symptomatology, trying to limit perhaps their workload, trying to correct some elements of their balance or visual ocular system with therapies until we uh, get them better. And in that cohort of people that doesn't get better within the first several weeks, then we need to take more advanced steps about treating those symptoms that may include everything from medications to other therapies to further investigation of what is really going on. Here at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, we're involved in a number of research projects related to traumatic brain injury. We have a large collaborative grant with the Department of Defense in which we're looking at biomarkers, blood tests that may tell us about not only the injury but the recovery process. We're doing advanced imaging, looking at white matter and gray matter abnormalities that may be subtle signs and in particular beginning to look at neuroinflammation and the way brain injury causes the activation in certain parts of the brain to be different. We're also involved in a number of different treatment trials for those individuals with more chronic symptoms, for those individuals with uh, problems in their thinking or memory or higher level issues related to that, everything from pharmacotherapy to low level light based therapy as a potential way to ameliorate their symptoms or help the recovery curve go faster.